here. I can eat it in We have 
Rosenberg Mayor Joe Gorecki. City Manager of Richmond, Mr. Glenn Gilmore. <laughs> we have Mr. Gilbert Lemos, who is the Vice President of the Fort Bend County Council 188 of the League of United Latin American Citizens. Post 350, Meadville, Texas. He has another sister. Another sister. Another sister in the bank, Oh, Ms. Mendiola, yes, please. Celia, is Tony here?
about five years ago, I had a conversation with then JP, Jim Adolphus. <clears throat> it concerned the portrait of a young soldier whose portrait hung in this building. And if you happen to walk through the front doors of the courthouse, which nowadays nobody does, you would happen to notice his portrait on the wall to your left. Obviously, you could not see it if you walked in any other area into the courthouse unless you intentionally walked out these doors and looked to your right. And Judge Adolphus and I thought that that was not the place for that particular portrait. I knew very little about Macario Garcia at that particular time. Judge Adolphus knew far more, and he told me a bit of the story of Macario Garcia. And we thought it fitting that his portrait hang in a more suitable spot here in our courthouse, the seat of justice in Fort Bend County. And so we spoke to then County Judge Mike Rosell, who was very happy to have a Memorial Day service <coughs> about five years ago and bring a bit of respect long overdue to Macario Garcia by hanging his portrait here within the rotunda. <laughs> but it didn't seem like it was enough. <coughs> the portrait hung here with the words Macario Garcia, M-A-R-C-A-R-I-O, is spelled first name, Congressional Medal of Honor winner. And that was located right here on the then existing nameplate. But it didn't tell you much about the story of Macario Garcia <coughs> and what he had done to earn the Congressional Medal of Honor. Judge Adolphus and I kicked the idea around a bit that it would be proper to have a plaque placed under his portrait so that all who visit Fort Bend County's seat of justice might know how it came to be that Macario Garcia earned, not won, not got, but earned the Congressional Medal of Honor. I became a bit more familiar with the story of Macario Garcia by chatting with Steve Longoria, an attorney who used to work in the district attorney's office, and who, during the course of an oral history project concerning Vietnam veterans, Korean War veterans, but especially World War II veterans, became close to the family of Macario Garcia, gained much information and insight into the man and shared that with me. I spoke with Judge Adolphus and said, it might be a good time, Judge, <coughs> to have a plaque dedication unveiling ceremony on a special holiday. And so we thought that this Veterans Day would be a fitting time to show the world and share with the world the story of Macario Garcia and how it came to be that he did earn the Congressional Medal of Honor and have that displayed on a plaque beneath his portrait which we will shortly unveil today. At this time, I'd like to call upon that gentleman of whom I spoke moments ago. He was raised in Corpus Christi, Texas, having been born on November 22, 1965. He read his first military book entitled American Fighter Pilots of World War II when he was but 10 years old. For the next seven years, he wasn't reading school books and law books, I might imagine. He read extensively and only on World War II. In 1988, he graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a bachelor's degree in history. And in 1993, he graduated from law school at Texas Southern Thurgood Marshall School of Law. I'm proud to say that he served as a prosecutor with the Fort Bend County DA's office from 1993 through 1995. Since then, his practice has been in civil and criminal defense right here in Fort Bend County. 
he and his wife Tracy had been married 12 years, and they've got two daughters, ages 9 and 5. He likes to say that while he's not chasing his daughters, in his spare time, he still likes to read. Although he hasn't told his wife yet, his dream job is to be a tutor guide on a ship traveling the islands of the uh, Pacific War. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Lagoria. Army divisions from the top down are trained as fighting units. 
The men all go through basic and advanced training together. The divisions are usually set up by region. For example, the 4th Infantry Division Macario was eventually assigned to was a New Jersey National Guard outfit. Replacements replace friends and comrades who have fallen in combat. Veterans usually look at the new guys with con contempt for fear that their inexperience will get not only the new guy killed, but the veteran as well. Replacements have to quickly earn the trust and support of the soldiers around them. For almost a year now, the United States and England prepared for the invasion of Europe. Growing stockpiled weapons and materials sat bolting in all conceivable locations. The joke in England was the large anti-aircraft balloons that flew over its cities kept England afloat. Thousands of men trained for missions, though they had not yet learned where the target was. In Europe, Hitler also prepared for the invasion. For four years, he ordered conscripted soldiers and slave laborers to build his vaunted Atlantic Wall. Covering the entire coast of France was several feet thick concrete and concrete enforced gun emplacements. Countless miles of barbed wire, countless numbers of mines, guns, and men. Adolf Hitler knew the Allies were coming, but he did not know where. <coughs> he believed, and the Allies led him to let him continue to believe the invasion would come at the Pas de area, the narrowest point of the English Channel between England and France. I apologize for it being small. This is the best I could do over the weekend. Uh, but just as a, a reference point, Pali Calais is right here, and this is England. Hitler believed the invasion would come here. On June 6, 1944, Macario Garcia was still in the replacement pool when he learned of the Allied invasion of Normandy, Normandy, France. A week later, he was assigned as a scout to the 4th Infantry Division, 22nd Infantry Regiment, B Company. The war began for Macario Garcia on June 16th when he arrived in Normandy between Omaha and Utah beaches. Omaha and Utah beaches. Utah beach is right here, Omaha is here, and then the other allied beaches are all in here. While Hitler's west wall had been breached by the, by the 16th, the Americans were still trying to move further inland off the beaches. Macario remembered when he first got ashore being told the front was just 500 yards away. We were prepared to approach the enemy. American guns and emplacements were right on the side. When the first one went off, I thought it was from the enemy. We all hit the ground. Macario's infantry regiment had been called upon to push in a northwest direction toward the towns of, and I'm sorry my French is not good, but Kienville, Christbeck, and Montebourg and eventually the port of Sherbourne, which is in this direction. They need the port of Sherbourne to open up, uh, obviously, supply lines. On June 20th, 1944, Macario Garcia was wounded by an artillery barrage. I'm not sure on exactly whose garage, the Germans or the Americans, but I don't think it mattered to Macario at the time. He received the first of his two Purple Hearts for this injury. While the Americans now held the entire Cotentin Peninsula, by the end of June and mid-July, the Allied leaders were quickly fearing the stalemate had developed. This is the Cotentin Peninsula right here. By end of July, <coughs> from the beaches of Normandy, we have along this line to calm, almost to calm. <coughs> it had taken much too long for the Americans to move through Normandy, Bocage, or Hedro country. Hedros were centuries old, five to seven feet stone and wooded fences. Tree roots covered the fences that partitioned the Normandy farms. Every fence line was a strongly defended was strongly defended by well-entrenched and hidden German soldiers. Every fence line, only hundreds of feet apart, became a time-consuming life-and-death struggle. 
advances day after day were counted in feet and in yards. Khan in the British sector was to have been taken on June 6. By mid-July, it was still occupied by German forces. Fearing a World War I-style trench warfare, the Allies came up with several plans to break out of the Normandy countryside. Heavy and medium bombers would carpet bomb or saturate bomb small areas of enemy-occupied areas for Allied tanks and men to rush through before the smoke cleared. In the American sector near St. Lo, it was called Operation Cobra. Plan work, and by the end of July, the Americans were on the move. Here's St. Lo, and the Americans moved. Macario Garcia's 22nd Infantry Regiment went through Percy and Calvados in this direction. <coughs> By the end of July, American tanks and men plunged through the bomb gap and quickly began liberating French towns and counting gains by the miles. In early August, the 22nd Infantry defeated German garrisons in the town of Percy and St. Croix. Now that the gap had been opened and troops were able to maneuver, it was now known that the next move would be in Paris. At this time, the Americans tried to get avalanches, which was the cornerstone for the breakout. And Patton's troops, the Third Army, went this direction and this direction. Macario Garcia's unit, the Fourth Infantry Division, continued on that shoulder, on the right shoulder, in this direction towards Paris. The British are here. It was obvious that the St. Louis breakthrough had actually broken the main German defenses and coupled with Hitler's reckless gamble counterattack toward Mauritania and subsequent near annihilation, of, almost subsequent annihilation of Hitler's entire army group B in the Falaise Gap, Allied commanders believed the next actual encounter with strong hostile forces would not come until Paris and the Seine River Line. While the 4th Division continued to contain and push towards Paris, General Patton's 3rd Army moved south and east, enveloping the enemy. The liberation of Paris was a more <coughs> political and strategic prize. While French armed forces were given the opportunity to free the city, it was the 4th Division and the 22nd Infantry Regiment that overwhelmed the defenders. Due to political infighting as to who would get Paris, the Allies lost another opportunity to trap another large enemy force. To this day, veterans of the 4th get riled to hear the French being given credit for liberating Paris. While any U.S. soldier in Paris appreciated the love and adulation thrust upon them by celebrating Parisians, most knew Germany and now its west wall, where the Siegfried Line awaited them. With any luck, and if they were able to keep the Germans on the run, maybe the war would be over <coughs> by Christmas. Macario Garcia's army record indicates that he arrived in Belgium on September 8, 1944, and left Belgium on September 11, 1944. Between August and September, we moved Allied forces, captured Paris, and continued on. Here's Belgium, and it continued through. It was near Hanfield. He arrived in Germany September 11, 1944. Here, the 22nd Infantry Regiment began probing the Siegfried Line. It was near Hanfield, Germany on September 16, 1944, when Mercario earned the Bronze Star with a V for Valor. His citation reads, Private Garcia, first scout of the rifle company, was given the mission of obtaining information concerning German troops opposing his company. He moved forward into enemy territory and for a period of three hours made observations of German activity. Although he was in danger of discovery at any time by enemy patrols or outpost troops, he escaped detection and returned to his company with vital information concerning the location and disposition of German troops. The results of his reconnaissance contributed materially to the subsequent successful operations of his company. Subsequently, subsequent attacks by the battalions of the 22nd Infantry succeeded in penetrating the Siegfried Line to a depth of several miles. However, because of lack of supplies, ammunition, and equipment, the 22nd was unable to exploit its gains. The French supply lines from the Normandy beaches now hindered the advancing Allied forces more than German activity 
and the once rapid advance was grinding to a halt. It is believed that had the supplies been available, the line could have been breached and the Allied forces driven well into Germany. At this time, the German armies were staggering and confused to such an extent that weeks would have been required before they could have organized the defensive line. The Americans gave them the weeks. <coughs> After some weeks as a static line, Macario's unit was once again prepared to go on the offensive. South of Aachen, near Liege, is the Hurtigen Forest, and now the Germans had had the time to prepare and man its defenses. Aachen is here, Liege is here, the Hurtigen Forest <coughs> is about at this point. <coughs> in a matter of only a few days, it was to be the scene of one of the bloodiest battlefields in the, war, in the world. The trees, uh, an, author, an author wrote, the trees and undergrowth of the forest were so dense that areas within the forest had never seen sunlight. The trees were of various types, firs, spruce, pine, cedar. Roads within the, within the forest were few. The only means of moving about was fire breaks. Lanes cut through the timber, which were extremely narrow and poorly kept. Actually, Hurtigan was a cold forest hell, a death factory. It blocked the main approaches to Cologne and the Ruhr Valley. The terrain was difficult enough, but across the front stretched belts of mines and barbed wire rigged with thousands of booby traps. Dug in machine guns and automatic weapons are placed to spray entire areas with interlocking fire. German artillery, more dangerous in the woods because of tree burst, was zeroed in on every conceivable objective. The weather was miserable. Constant rain, snow, and freezing temperatures. Living for days in water-filled holes, usually without blankets or winter overcoats, and never a fire, troops had no escape from the cold and wet. Macario's 1st Battalion follows the initial attack on November 16th and moves north into the woods. The battle was confusing and bloody. Any gains were in defeat and then immediately <coughs> lost. American units attack and withdraw, only to watch other units attack and withdraw. The battle for the Hurstigan Forest over the next several days draws more and more American units into the forest. A member of Macario's battalion remembers remember the battle. You can't get all of the dead because you can't find them. And they stay there to remind the guys advancing as to what might hit them. You can't get protection. You can't see. Artillery slashes the trees like a sieve. Everything is tangled. Everybody is cold and wet. Then we attack again, and soon there is only a handful of men left. Then like in the movies, the word comes down from headquarters that the old man was a hill. This hill is near the German town of Grosshau and is the key to breaking out of the forest and onto Cologne. On November 27, 1944, leaving a squad at the base of the hill, Macario and another soldier slowly creep forward. They move far enough, along without incident, when they notice a period of silence. At that instant, the machine gun opens up, killing the man next to Macario. Ducking out of sight, Ricardo crawls around the machine gun nest and kills the soldiers inside. Returning to his squad, another machine gun opens up, and again Ricardo drops, dives, dives to the ground. Sighting the second machine gun crew, he again quietly makes his way around them and kills and captures the soldiers. Once the machine gun nest are removed, Macario's remaining company is now able to, in the words of his lieutenant in the Medal of Honor recommendation, to drive on their objective with the undisputed glory of having won one of the greatest battles of the Hurtigan Forest. For his actions, Macario is first awarded his second bronze star, and he is also recommended for the Medal of Honor. Only after I realize he has been wounded. Initially refusing medical attention, his lieutenant orders him to be evacuated for treatment. He is soon on his way to a hospital in England, where he spends the next two months. 
He returns to his unit in Luxembourg on January 24th, soon after the Battle of the Bulls in the Ardennes Forest. Here's Luxembourg. This is where Mario Garcia comes back to at that time, and here is the Ardennes Forest in this area. Luckily, he missed most of that battle. A renewed offensive takes Macario back into Germany on February 3rd, 1945. By this time, paperwork is being advanced through the various chains of command for the Medal of Honor. In his recommendation, Macario's Lieutenant Tony Mazzaro writes, due to the initiative, bravery, and patriotic devotion of this soldier, and he puts in parentheses, who had just recently become a citizen in the United States, and who said he only wanted to do something for my country. The lives of many men were saved, and Company B, 22nd Infantry, were able to seize its objective, dominating terrain from which the fortified German town of Groshau was cut off from the west. On March 2nd, 1945, Mario Garcia left England to return home. On March 12th, he arrived in New York. On August 23rd, 1945, he received his Medal of Honor from President Truman in a ceremony at the White House. On June 25th, 1947, he became a United States citizen. He continued to serve his country while at the Veterans Administration offices, first in Vietnam and then in Houston until his death on, in December of 1972. I leave you with a quote from General George Patton. General George Patton. He said, wars may be fought with weapons, but they are won by men. It is the spirit of the man who follows and of the man who leads that gains the victory. Thank you.
3,420 roughly pencil figure of blue man have received the nation's highest award. That's the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, up until 1945, the uh, recipient, as they elect to be called, not winners, but recipients, have always been decorated individually, or two, and no more than three. Up until that afternoon, Monday, 23rd day of August, 1945, in the East Wing of the White House, President Harry Truman had the distinguished honor of decorating 28 officers and enlisted, among those of the young soldiers of Fort Bend County, name I kind of say He never did talk much about his experience, past and present. Most of you that knew him can quote me on that. The only experience that I recall is after my release from active duty was one Sunday afternoon at the church. Uh, I asked him about that ribbon he was wearing. It looked pretty neat. It looked like one of those uh, company ribbons they give you for 10, 20 years. Uh, as a matter of fact, Charlie Dawkins had one the other day, and uh, I was wondering if that was the one who was, uh, we're, we've been missing for the last 18 years, but apparently it wasn't. <laughs> 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 nice ribbon, just. <laughs> Macario uh, served his country, and he was real proud of us, not only his country, but his whole family as a whole. After his uh, release from active duty, he came back to Houston and worked at the VA to help veterans on their eligibility. That was uh, all vets that came back and didn't know uh, how to go about their benefits. That was the same purpose. And he held that position until his death in 1972. Now, in 1971, the year before his death, has been in the reserves, he held the highest rank possible. That's the highest enlistment rank possible. In 1983, they inaugurated the Army Reserve Medical Training Center, that's an OST, in his honor. And present of that ceremony was uh, John Towers and then Vice President George Bush. And it was uh, one of the distinctions to his honor that we had before that, we had the Enactment of the OS, uh, it's OST National Federal Civil Rights in Houston. In 1993, Federal Civil Elementary School in HISD. And the most recent one was in 1995 on uh, Old Richmond Road in FM 1464. That's Federal Civil Middle School. <clears throat> We'd like to thank each and every one of you that are here this afternoon. Uh, it's a good turnout. I like stated earlier, it's a day of remembrance. You should remember it's a day of victory. And that's the day, Veterans Day. Thank you. <clears throat> it's an honor to have the next gentleman here with us today to give us our keynote address. He's a native Texan and attended elementary school and high school in Thompson's and Richmond. Upon graduation in 1950 from Texas A&M, he was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Corps of Engineers. He entered active duty at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri in June 1951 and trained engineer replacements there until May of 1952 when he was assigned to the 8th United States Army in Korea. During that Korean conflict, at the time of which he served as a platoon leader and later as company commander of an engineering company. Upon release in 1953 from active duty, he joined the Army Reserve and served both staff and command positions at company, battalion, brigade, and division level. He's a graduate of the Engineer Officer Career Course, the Command and General Staff College, and the United States Army War College. 
He was awarded and decorated numerous times. They include the Meritorious Unit Commendation, <coughs> the United Nations Service Medal, the Korean Service Medal, the Meritorious Service Medal, and the Distinguished Service Medal. He retired in August 1985 after 35 years of commissioned service and resides in Richmond, Texas, with his wife, who joins him today, Anne. They've got five grown children, three sons and two daughters, and seven grandchildren. The serviceman's last assignment was Commander 75th Maneuver Area Command in Houston. While in that assignment, he was instrumental in gaining approval for the new Army Reserve Armory name for Sergeant Lucario Garcia, the soldier whom we honor today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Major General Army of the United States retired Robert E. Prosser. Near Groschau, Germany, 
single-handedly assaulted two enemy machine gun emplacements, attacking prepared positions on a wooden hill, which could be approached only through meager cover. His company was pinned down by intense machine gun fire and subjected to a concentrated artillery and mortar barrage. Although painfully wounded, he refused to be evacuated. And on his own initiative, crawled forward until he reached a position near an enemy emplacement. Hurling grenades, he boldly assaulted the position, destroyed the gun, and with his rifle, killed three of the enemy who attempted to escape. When he rejoined his company, a second machine gun opened fire, and again the intrepid soldier went forward, utterly disregarding his own safety. He stormed the position and destroyed the gun, killed three more Germans, and captured four prisoners. He fought on with his unit until the objective was taken, and only then did he permit himself to be removed for medical care. Private Garcia's conspicuous heroism, his inspiring, courageous conduct, and his complete disregard for his personal safety wiped out two enemy emplacements and enabled his company to advance and secure its objective. Signed, Harry Truman, President of the United States.